So let's talk about how we uh, control some of those emissions on uh, compost. And again, most of my studies also have been done here in Idaho, where we do a lot of dairy. Uh, so there are dairy center. Um, but also I, I did a study on um, measurement on emissions from a dairy from the compost yard. Um, so you can see here was the composting area. We also measure from the lagoon and the processing area. This was a 5,000 uh, free stall dairy. Um, and emissions, uh, in Idaho we have very defined seasons. So, we'll, so we start dividing those early on on warm, warm period and cold period. And you can see the dates there. Um, and you can see there is a difference between especially ammonia and in this case hydrogen sulfide that is what I, I measure uh, in this study. Um, so on the emission side, um, the ammonia on the warm season, uh, ammonia dominates and we have a diurnal variation as April mentioned. Um, and pick up, really pick up the hydrogen sulfate during the winter or during the cold season. Um, something to notice, this there is near the canyon, um, so we have an adiabatic daily change on the winds uh, from east to west every day. Uh, and those microclimates on, on each dairy, on each location uh, or production facility also contribute to different uh, emissions factors. Um, the compost pad that I showed had at that time a minimum management. So during the cold season got flooded. Um, so the emissions factors, I, I express them here for a square meter of surface of the composting pad. And, and we have an unexpected high uh, hydrogen sulfate emissions during the cold season, especially. Uh, but again, that's attributable to, to that flooding and to the lack of turning on, on the windows. So now, how we control those emissions from the compost? And uh, this is the same slide that April showed. It's a very good slide to divide it on when we have an aerobic condition on the left of, of this slide, uh, or an anaerobic condition on the right. Uh, how the process is going to develop on the compost varies greatly. Um, so on the left, we have here the different methods that I, I'm going to talk about during this presentation. And basically the methods, what they try to do is either uh, move the compost process to the left, uh, so we have aerobic conditions, uh, or block some of the processes, microbial or chemical uh, or physical, so we, we reduce the emissions of a particular uh, gas. Balancing the compost mix uh, the carbon to nitrogen ratio is the first method I will try always as the most effective, um, but that's when carbon sources are available. Um, most animal manures, dairy, swine, poultry, they don't have by themselves the carbon to nitrogen ratio uh, that we uh, strive for a 30 to one uh, mix. Um, so most dairy manures are on the teens from 12, to 20, I will say if you're using bedding. Um, so any addition of carbon helps, but there are certain carbon sources that are better than others, especially if you mix uh, a source that is, uh, have some chunks on, on big pieces, like a uh, couple centimeters or one inch in size and a small pieces. So that gives aeration at the same time that gives available carbon. Uh, on the picture here on the top, we see one of our compost turners here in southern Idaho. And this is a spring windrow uh, that has a lot of bedding material. We start very well in the spring composting that manure that we pile up during the winter. As we go at the end of the spring, summer, and in fall, we run out of, uh, comp of, of carbon because we are not bedding anymore. Uh, so, as April mentioned, at the end of the season, we are mostly turning dirt and, and manure without much carbon added. Um, here at the bottom is a study I'm going to show soon, and we have different uh, type of carbon that we mix on, on these windrows.
uh, adding carbon improves the composting process and it has, uh, in general, if you do well the composting process, a higher quality on the final product. Um, this is a study I did on mixing, trying to solve the problem of two industries, the dairy industry, the lack of carbon on the dairy industry, and the burning of the uh, prunings on the uh, grape industry. The grape industry needs to prune every year their, their vineyards, and they cannot leave these on the facilities because it, it hosts diseases that come back to the plants. Uh, so here in Idaho, the most common technique is to burn it every year. Um, so we grind them, we ground them, and we add it to dairy manure. Um, the dairy manure came from a smaller dairy that uh, has a good bedding, so it, it has a 23 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio to begin with. Uh, that is common only on, on dairies that have a lot of bedding. Um, so on the, the control was that, and the treatment were three methods of composting uh, with uh, the grape uh, prunings. Uh, so the carbon to nitrogen ratio, uh, we set a minimum of 40 because that's what is suggested by the organic standards uh, in Idaho. Uh, and some of them we went up to 60, that was kind of too much, and we're gonna see the results. Uh, here you see the temperatures of the, all the windrows, and the first three in red are the forced aerated was were the first windrows that I built. Uh, we put too much carbon, they were on the 60s, and also too little moisture. So that's what happens when you have uh, a windrow that you cannot turn and cannot add water anymore, so you don't reach those temperatures. Um, the other two methods, the passive aerated and the mechanically turned with the carbon, they did very good. Um, and the control, that is the dairy mechanically turned too, um, it did good at the beginning, but then the temperatures drop. And that's very common here in, in southern Idaho again, when we start with those uh, um, spring windrows and we run out of carbon by the third or third usually turn, so our temperatures go down. Um, the total nitrogen in, in this case, um, if you see at the beginning on the treatment windrows, those force aerated, uh, passive aerated and mechanically turned, uh, we start with less nitrogen because we added the carbon, but the, I want to bring attention to the difference between the initial and final total nitrogen. Look the difference on the control. So. Here, there is no much difference between the initial and the final. All this nitrogen here was lost to the environment. Um, at the end, one of the questions we have is, well, if we add the carbon and improve the composting process, are we gonna have more nitrogen? Uh, in this case, we didn't. The, all, the, all the control and treatment have the similar nitrogen content at the end, but improve the efficiency of the composting process. Um, here you see again that improve, improvement because the carbon to nitrogen ratio was very high on the um, treatment um, windrows, not so high on the control windrows. So that uh, bacterial community used that carbon uh, more efficiently. The other thing that we have probably a dilution effect uh, is that the total salts and same happens with the phosphorus and potassium was lower uh, on the treatment windrows that on the control. That allows you to put more compost, uh, more tonnage per acre or per hectare. And here in Idaho, we are limited by the amount of phosphorus you can put on, on your soils. Um, so, and the other thing, well, obviously when, when you compost, you concentrate nutrients except nitrogen, the other nutrients are concentrated. So another way to control emissions is by adding uh, additives to the feedstock. So especially when the carbon sources are uh, scarce. Here we live in Southern Idaho, it's a high plain desert. We have very nice irrigated agriculture, plenty of cows to go around, uh, but we don't have enough sources of carbon. So we have a nitrogen excess uh, in the balance. So there are certain additives that can help to reduce uh, those emissions. Uh, and we're gonna talk about all, all these. 
and I, I divide them in chemical, physical, and uh, biological. When you are adding additives, April mentioned that many producers here, they turn the manure, uh, just enough to reduce volume and moisture. Uh, actually, we don't water them, but some, some producers don't water the manures don't the, during the process. Uh, and those are uh, added to um, extensive crops like alfalfa, corn silage, or cereals. Uh, so you need to check your cost benefit in these cases. Uh, chemical additives, they can change the pH. So by uh, lowering or, or increasing the pH, depending on, on what you want to do here again in Idaho and in southern Idaho, we have um, higher pH on the soils, higher pH on the water. So that produces a loss of ammonia during the composting process. So if you reduce that pH, you can keep some of that ammonia from gassing off. Uh, they react with the specific comp compounds um, and in general change the biology uh, of uh, by encouraging the survival of certain microorganisms. Uh, they can change at the end the, the final uh, nutrient content of or disposition of certain, certain nutrients on your final compost. Um, some additives, uh, chemicals like gypsum and some acids might have some operational risk and need to be careful and very well informed when you are applying them. Physical additives, uh, there are different uh, action mechanisms of action. Um, in general, they increase also the composting aeration uh, to that uh, are working very well are zeolite and biochar. Both of them have high, high cation exchange capacity. Um, and um, the benefits on those two carry well beyond the application of the compost. Usually they stay on the soils and, and bring some other benefits. Uh, but there is a mix box of results on the studies on how the benefits uh, impact the crops. Uh, and that depends a lot on, on the characteristics of each of those additives. And the other one are bulking agents. In the case of zeolites, I did a study, uh, on-farm study, where we added clean up zeolite, uh, zeolite from Idaho to a dairy mix manure and some straw. And again, the windrows were uh, torn with the tractor. I didn't have a compost turner. Um, and, and the difference is on this one, we corrected the moisture during the whole process uh, to, to have a true composting process. Um, and we captured ammonia emissions and uh, did some lab analysis. On, on this picture, you see on the top picture, those are the zeolites before mixing with the tractor. Then we build the windrow and we screen it at the end. So in ammonia emissions, um, we, the cumulative ammonia emissions reduction was 14, around 14%, 14 uh, but that's on the first three turns. We did five turns, the, the turn zero, or the first turn is the building itself of the windrow after mixing all the components. Um, so, and we didn't measure the ammonia during the whole time. Um, so I estimate you can see here the red line is the treatment and the blue line is the control. So the total uh, reduction is expected to be around 20, 30%. And there was a perceived, uh, noticeable perceived reduction on the other among treatment and control. So the first three pair of columns here are on the, when we build the windrow, the turn, the first turn. This is the second turn on the three that, follow and the last two also is on the third turn. The other two turns, we didn't measure ammonia. Something that um, also um, surprised us a little was, if you see on the ammonium, even on the initial in the treatment is lower. So the zeolites start absorbing that ammonium right away. Again, this is was on farm, so we're adding those zeolites to the compost mix, mixing and building the windrow. The whole process took us for each windrow six hours. So, and then we took the sample after the windrow was constructed. So obviously those zeolites were um, capturing ammonium right away. Um, at the end of the process, the nitrate um, increased uh, 
having three times more nitrate on, on the uh, treatment than the control. Um, and we have a tendency to lower values on total organic carbon and carbon to nitrogen ratio also indicated that there is a better use of the few carbon or the little carbon that is available on those mixes. Uh, another thing we did with this study was uh, we did solvita test uh, to control uh, on the finished compost. And if you see the three first rows are the control, the three second or the bottom three rows are the treatment. And I put some colors to distinguish kind of, well, on the green area is all good. Basically the zeolites um, simulate the addition of carbon when you go to the 30 to one that we didn't on this study. Um, so they, they have less phytotoxicity, less, less noxious hazard and, and uh, ammonia or nitrogen loss potential that they control windrows. Uh, the control windrows will be what is a, a regular compost here. So with that, we can say that, yeah, we reduce the emissions, but also we generate the compost that can be, a, can be sold for high end users, uh, like landscaping or horticulture uh, users. So another way to reduce emissions is using biochar. Uh, biochar uh, is produced by the uh, burning of carbonous materials like manure or wood uh, in the absence of oxygen or very low oxygen. So the, here is a chart of how biochar works. Uh, you can produce biogas, bio oil, and oil and the biochar at the same time. And in this picture at the bottom, this is what we are adding usually at compost when uh, sometimes you think that you're gonna add biochar that you add a powder. Uh, well, it might be some powder there is good, but you need to add also that as, as a bigger, a little bigger size. Um, and a study about, uh, on, on, on biochar, uh, there is a high variation on air emissions depending on the amount of biochar you put, um, the dosage and the, where the biochar comes from. It's very good on reducing ammonia emissions as well as methane and nitrous oxide. Uh, on this chart here, we see the black one on the left is the control. Um, and to the right, we have increasing uh, dosage of biochar. Um, and here's when we start seeing some um, gas swap or emission swaps. And it's very good on controlling nitrogen loss, as you see, and in controlling the total greenhouse uh, gases emissions. Uh, but even we need to be conscious that if sometimes you reduce one gas like the nitrogen emission and you increase in the case of biochars the carbon dioxide uh, emissions uh, and that's because you have more carbon and you activate the microbiological um, activity that generates carbon dioxide and we see that also in another study with biochar uh, where uh, the ammonia decreases with the increase of biochar content, but at the same time, the carbon dioxide emissions have a, an inverse relationship. Adding bulking agents. Um, the most common bulking agent is also a carbon source, as here is again on, on that study I did with the vine prunings. And um, it could be wood chips, could be a straw, uh, so that, that helps a lot to aerate and, and, and reduce the bulk density of the compost pile. Um, other bulking agents could be biochar, zeolites, pumice, perlite are also common. Uh, and it's not common in agriculture, but in some specialized composting techniques uh, with sludge or industrial sludge, they can even use plastic chips uh, to increase the bulk density, to reduce, sorry, the bulk density, increase the aeration, and then those are extracted on the screening at the end of the process. Um, so basically the idea is to increase the aeration. Um, there is a reduction, in general, significant reduction on nitrous oxide and, and methane because you reduce the amount of anaerobic pockets you have around. Uh, but it might come with some increase in ammonia and definitely an increase in carbon dioxide. Uh, so here we have a study where they show the bulk density increase from left to right. So what we have a, a good bulking agent working on the left 
uh, we have more ammonia emissions and nitrous oxide emissions are reduced. As that bulking agent is reduced or is collapsed or is absent, uh, we increase the nitrous oxide emissions because we have start having more anaerobic pockets uh, and we reduce the ammonia. Um, biological amendments, in general, that are used to stimulate the compost uh, production or speed the compost process. They target the specific processes via community establishment. So they help establish certain communities or you add certain like thermophilae so that you can increase your temperature in the compost. Uh, so you can add even active compost uh, or a specific microorganisms or nutrients to target a certain biology in the compost to encourage them to reproduce more or enzymes to reduce uh, the, or break down carbonous uh, components and, and have more carbon available, for example. Um, there are no many uh, comprehensive studies on, on this case. So let's, uh, Kao et al. also did a meta-analysis and they compare uh, the different amendments. Um, so we have total nitrogen, ammonia, nitrous oxide, methane, and uh, global warming potential. Um, and if you see here at the center is the line of zero efficiency, they do nothing, or they increase emissions, or to the left, they reduce emissions. Um, and you can see that most of them have some effect on reducing emissions. In some cases, you increase certain emissions. Again, the gas swap. Those numbers here, the number, uh, the single number is the number of studies they include on the meta-analysis and the numbers in between parentheses is the pair comparisons they have. I mentioned the increase of carbon <coughs> on the on the windrows and here they analyze also in several studies uh, what happened when you add the additives with lower carbon like less than 20 to 1 or between 20 to 1 and 30 to 1 with added carbon. And you can see that uh, in most cases, the additives work better on a balanced ration, on, on a compost that has already more carbon in it. But on the other hand, there are a good um, assistance to reduce emissions when you don't have that carbon directly. Um, so that depends a lot on what is your objective. Um, again, this is also from uh, Ba et al. He compared, they compared several methods of composting, adding carbon, uh, microorganisms, uh, gypsum, compressing or covering the compost too. And they compared that with vermicomposting and, and biofilters. And again, most of them, except well, when, when you start doing some uh, swap of gases, but most of them have some positive effect. Um, adding filtering layers also is another method. It works very good in a static composting sy systems. Uh, if you have in vessel or silo, as April mentioned, uh, you can have a separate design biofilter uh, or enforced aerated too. You can run that on a negative pressure and, and go in through a, a filter. But if not, you can add layers on top of the windrows. It's not very practical for windows and that you turn uh, regularly, but it's a solution. For example, the exception is mortality composting or, or composting on very odorous feedstock like fish guts. Uh, in that case, you can put a layer on top because those windows are not turned so often. So that uh, really have a very good effect on ammonia emissions and other emissions uh, reduction. Uh, so then when, by the time you're gonna turn that windrow, uh, that burst of first initial odor uh, is reduced. Um, so in filtering layers, you can use compost, as you see on the top picture here, this is a force aerated uh, windrow, that this one on the, on the right is totally covered with compost, and here you see the mixture, uh, the initial mix, and, and half of the wind windrow is covered with compost. Uh, on the bottom left, you see a passive aerated windrow, uh, covered with a straw as, as a filter, as a biofilter too, or a synthetic cover uh, that also uh, reduces emissions. 
Comparing these methods, you can see here we have methane emissions and carbon dioxide emissions at the bottom. Uh, again, the gas swap, for example, turning, force aeration, uh, and bulking agents reduce methane emissions but increase carbon dioxide emissions. Um, in this case, also part of it all also did the meta analysis. Um, and the comparison we are seeing is the different methods against doing nothing, just piling up uh, your manure or your waste. Uh, again, in these cases with the ammonia and the nitrous oxide, again, the ones that reduce, for example, turning um, increases ammonia emissions as well as bulking agents, but reducing nitrous oxide emissions at the bottom. Um, so you can't be able to, for example, increase turning and adding zeolite that will take care of, of that gas swap a little bit. Uh, and again, uh, compare on all the methods compared to doing nothing, most of the methods have a positive effect on uh, gas emissions. Uh, force aerated, and I mentioned that uh, usual force aeration also uh, generates a little bit more uh, or sometimes increase gas emissions, but uh, and the counterpart is dramatically speed up the process. Uh, and also, uh, usually, if it is in vessel, you can connect that to a biofilter and probably get rid of 90% of the emissions on a biofilter or zeolite filter or something like that. And with that, I'm finishing.